On stage now is uh, David Kim. Um, he will talk about Connect Fusion. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the talk. We have reserved about 10 to 15 minutes for that. Um, so please prepare questions. Um, we also have a, a signal angel in the room. So if you want to ask questions, the people that are watching the streams, if you want to ask questions via IRC, you're welcome to do so. So please give it up for David Kim. Hi, so um, I'm David Kim. I'm actually a PhD student at Newcastle University in, uh, in the UK. And I'm sponsored by Microsoft Research, and I'm basically doing my PhD research there. And um, today I'm going to present and demonstrate Connect Fusion. Maybe some of you have seen it on YouTube, or maybe have seen it in a conference. And uh, Connect Fusion is a real time 3D scanning system that just uses a Connect and allows us to. Um, capture static and dynamic scenes with a $100 Kinect camera uh, without modifying the hardware or requiring any external infrastructure. And I'm also going to demonstrate how um, this system can be used for dynamic users, for example, um, to do um, user interaction um, and detect multi-touch on any surface and to also enable augmented reality applications. So before I jump to the first demonstration of the system, I would like to briefly describe the motivation for this work. So in November last year, Xbox released a dev camera for $100, which would have previously cost around $10,000. And our group based in Cambridge was really excited about this technology because it was the first time that the dev camera was available to anyone. And so we ended up building prototypes for 3D input and augmented reality displays in the last 18 months. And I'll hopefully be able to present some of them at the end of the talk if we have some time left. So um, to the real motivation of Kinect Fusion. So a few members of our groups have been working on augmented reality um, projects where a uh, handheld uh, Pico projector should be used to um, enable uh, um, user attention in any environment. But many of the previous work which um, um, use Pico projectors, they always um, relied on external trackers. They relied on Vicon trackers uh, and also required the user to specify the room geometry to truly interact with the surfaces. So we looked into tracking solutions and robotics which didn't rely on infrastructure and which um, could simultaneously locate and map the environment just by using a laser range scanner and a video camera. And um, these systems are called SLAM. Uh, but um, the, so the solutions we found, they were either too slow or not precise enough. The ge geometry was quite rough. But at some point, one of us suggested to use a Kinect camera instead of a laser range finder and a or a video camera. And um, we found the algorithms we needed to build up a 3D model out of a Kinect camera. But uh, we also um, had problems with the computation speed. We had to handle so much data within a couple of milliseconds that the CPU couldn't keep up. And to cut a long story short, uh, we ended up using very fast gamer graphics cards to uh, offload all the computation work on 500 cores of a graphics card. And uh, we achieved uh, real-time speeds. And yeah, these are the pictures I forgot to show. So these were the initial prototype. This is the initial prototype of the Pico projector. It relied on external trackers. And um, we wanted to get uh, result, which is shown at the bottom right. So um, uh, let's just dive into the actual demo. I'll show you, uh, present you a demo first, and then we can talk about um, the more specific parts of the implementation. So uh, let me quickly switch to the demo.
Okay, so um, the window you see on the top left is the uh, live depth image. So um, bright pixels indicate that these points are closer to the camera, and darker pixels indicate that they are further away, farther away from the camera. But as you can see here, um, the depth image is quite noisy. You have lots of fluctuations, and um, you see lots of holes in the depth image. Uh, and also, uh, it doesn't remember what it has seen. It only sees what it sees, but it doesn't build up a 3D model. And uh, what you see uh, at the bottom um, is the output of our system. It's the 3D reconstruction. And uh, let me switch to another view. So in our system, we compare the previous depth image with the current one. We see how they differ, and we calculate the offset transformation between the previous frame and the current frame. And we are now able to um, track the camera's position without having any external infrastructure. So when I rotate the camera, you see in the yellow frosting that it rotates with it. And when I move it to another side, it always knows where it is relative to the uh, model. And when I, when I sweep the camera, <laughs> when I sweep the camera, I accumulate more and more data into this volumetric model, and it's truly 360. So I can walk around, capture something from behind, and then later on, I can navigate within this 3D model and go in, dive in. And we see that in this uh, reconstruction, the holes are filled, and uh, the more data I integrate, I get more details out of the system. Can you the model? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, wait. <laughs> yeah, I'm just struggling with, the, uh, with our implementation of the virtual uh, camera, but yeah, uh, let me uh, get some of you up and let me <laughs> scan, in, scan in the face. Who would like to volunteer to come up? I think the lady, or yeah, the lady should come up. Please, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, could you come here and um, please hold still? <laughs> okay, so choose a comfortable pose, please. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll now start to scan you in. So I'll move this away. You can now freely move. You can look at yourself uh, at the screen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK. So uh, we have captured her here. And still, she's still visible here in this model. Yeah. And also, Another benefit of the system is that it also reacts to changes in the scene. So when I move this cup to another place, it will slowly disappear from where it was originally. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, here it appears back. <laughs> okay, so um, that was the first demo. Um, I'll just jump straight back uh, to the slides. So, um, yeah, before I go into describing all the components, let me just briefly uh, describe how Kinect actually works. Some people thought that Kinect is based on time of flight. So people thought that it um, uh, projects light infrared light into the environment and um, 
measures the speed the light travels, but it's actually much simpler. Um, Kinect is based on, on a stereo matching algorithm. You know, from using two video cameras, you can kind of reconstruct 3D models. And uh, Kinect works the same way. So um, uh, there's an infrared laser projector which projects a speckle pattern into the environment. So maybe some of you have already seen how it looks like. This is what the Kinect camera sees. So the Kinect camera has um, the infrared laser projector and a color RGB camera, which doesn't do anything. It, it doesn't do anything for depth calculation. It's just for augmenting 3D graphics with color. And the IR camera is the camera which actually picks up this dot pattern. So you might think, how is this stereo when it only uses a single infrared camera? Um, so um, this camera utilizes a quite clever trick. Um, the infrared laser uh, projects a random laser pattern, but um, it is like having a camera looking through, this, through the lens of the laser projector. So the camera which sits where the laser projector is would exec uh, see exactly the same pattern um, at any time. So uh, we can just get rid of the second infrared camera. So the infrared laser projector becomes virtually the second uh, video camera. So it's quite easy. And the depth calculation happens on the device. OK, so uh, that was a quick introduction to how Kinect works. So I'll uh, now continue to talk briefly uh, about some related work uh, that is related to uh, Kinect Fusion. And I'll go through the main system components and describe them, how they uh, conceptually work. And uh, at the end, uh, we will have, have some um, time reserved to discuss any open questions and ideas. So, uh, so uh, when we first uh, saw the results of Kinect Fusion, we realized that the gaming device living in a living room um, could actually compete with a $50,000 handheld 3D scanner. Um, so uh, this is some related work. This is kind of slightly more precise, but we uh, found a good trade-off between speed and quality. And there's also a considerable work amount of work uh, in the area of SLAM, as I said, simultaneous location and mapping in uh, robotics and computer vision. There, uh, a single uh, camera is used to uh, extract features from motion in the image. And um, um, the system tracks off these features and create a really sparse uh, point cloud of the scene and uses these to track the camera within an environment. But these works uh, focus on the tracking aspect of the camera or the robot. So they don't uh, really create this compelling uh, results we've um, just seen. And another set of work um, is done in the field of computer graphics. Um, uh, for example, uh, by using uh, high quality laser range scanners or light stages or multiple photographies. But um, they rely on heavy infrastructure and uh, they are not suited for uh, online rendering. So they happen offline within a couple of hours. But um, they work with higher, larger scales and higher accuracy than ours. So um, Kinect Fusion lies somewhere between the SLAM system, which is good in tracking, but not really good in reconstructing surfaces, and these works, which are really good at re reconstructing surfaces, but which can't perform in real time. So um, these are the core components of uh, Kinect Fusion. 
So when we uh, get depth data from the Kinect camera, we first project these depth points into 3D space. So these depth measurements become 3D point clouds in our system. And then we also um, calculate the uh, surface orientation and store them in a normal map. And then based on the point clouds of the current image frame and the previous um, image frame, we compare the relative spatial offset between the frames. And then once we know the six degrees of freedom orientation of the camera, we can then actually integrate the depth data in a global volumetric uh, data structure. So this data structure doesn't only um, contain the 3D point cloud of my uh, current view, but it uh, stores, memorizes all the, all the scenes it has seen previously. And then um, when we want to render um, the model, which is stored in the volume, uh, volumetric uh, data grid, we raycast through the volume and create a rendering. Uh, we also create a synthetic depth map, which is used to stabilize the tracking. And as a side product of the camera tracking, we also get outliers. And outliers are points which lie too far apart and uh, which would uh, otherwise degrade the tracking. But we use these points to later um, sense touch, human touch of surfaces and um, similar things. So I'll come back to these uh, later. So um, before I really dive in to uh, describe all the system components, um, a couple of words uh, about GPU implementation and speed. A CPU has, um, in a PC, has uh, usually six, one to six cores. So, um, you know, dual core, quad core, uh, and they perform uh, really fast, like three, three gigahertz per, per core. But uh, in a graphics card, um, they're actually much more many cores, like 500, for example, but they perform slower with 600 to 700 megahertz. But as most of our components are parallelizable, we um, do calculations on individual pixels and individual voxels. We can um, uh, really make use of the uh, power of the graphics cards. So uh, we can um, do calculations on 500 pixels at once um, in parallel with a, a graphics cards where a CPU could only handle six at a time. And um, that's the reason why uh, we achieve this real-time speed. Okay, now uh, back to the core components. So uh, when we track the camera, uh, we have data from the previous frame and the current frame. So we see in the, in the left, in the green frustum, that the camera was more to the left and it moved to the right. And, uh, but the camera doesn't know that it has moved, so we have to somehow figure it out how it moved. And to do that, we uh, utilize an algorithm which is called um, ICP. ICP stands for Iterative Closest Point, and um, it is typically used in 3D scanning applications to align multiple overlapping point clouds together. So, for example, if you have a number of independent scans of uh, different areas of a large object. Using ICP, you can align them together to build up a bigger point cloud where all the um, independent scans are aligned. But um, this um, algorithm um, has one requirement. It needs these point clouds to already roughly aligned to each other. And this is uh, usually done manually with the mouse in the, in, in the 3D scanning program. But in our case, uh, the point clouds of the previous frame and the current frame are already roughly aligned because uh, we have a really fast camera. So we have 30 frames per second. So when we move the camera like this, the, the positional offset is around five centimeters. So they are already roughly aligned, so we can uh, make use of this fast algorithm. 
So um, I'll now go through the individual steps of um, this algorithm. So first, uh, we associate 3D points from the previous frame with the 3D points from the current frame. So we create associations between the two images. Uh, but we do this really naively by uh, just taking points from the same uh, image positions. So when the camera doesn't move, um, the point on the uh, top left should coincide with the uh, pixel in the top left in the right image. And for example, the point on the nose should associate with the um, nose in the other frame. But when we move the camera, um, the association gets corrupted. So here we move the camera slightly to the right, and the association is, isn't right. But um, it's OK, because uh, I'll later show you why it's OK to have this slight um, offset between the associations. So um, once we have projectively associated the two point clouds together, we then um, check if um, the point pair is um, actually usable. So if the points lie too far apart, for example, uh, the point bottom right, which associates a point on the t-shirt with a point in the background, um, for such uh, cases, we um, check if the distance and the angles are compatible to each other. If they're too far away, then we just throw it and mark it um, as an outlier because it would degrade the tracking too much. And um, so the left image shows how the points of the previous frame and the current frame are associated with each other. So this is a top-down view where both surfaces are shown overlapped. And in the right image, we see that only some of the points are compatible to each other. Some of the points are too far away, or the angles are too different. So after we've checked the compatibility of a point pair, we then try to uh, minimize an energy function. So the energy function um, describes the sum of the squared distances between the points, and we solve a linear system which tries to minimize um, this disparity between the point clouds globally. So we try to find the best fit to minimize the distances for the whole point cloud. Um, and then once we have found this transformation, which um, describes the offset between the two frames, we apply it, this transformation to the current image frame and then um, transform it to a new position. So um, here in this image, we see at the top, um, an association between the previous um, surface and the current surface. So you see the association isn't quite right. But we iterate the steps one to five a couple of times. And um, whenever we um, iterate over this algorithm, um, the two surfaces um, come closer together, and then we do an, another round of association between points. And by doing this kind of association with the same um, depth images a couple of times, they will eventually um, slide to each other at some point. And uh, we do this kind of um, uh, iteration for um, about five times uh, per frame. Um, uh, per frame, five times. Five yeah, yeah, and it takes about like three milliseconds because it's done on the GPU. So, um, yeah, this was the camera tracking. So the next part uh, is the integration of the data. So now uh, we know um, when we see a depth image where it belongs to spatially. So we have a relative. Um, spatial reference of the current frame to the previous frame, so we can integrate it to um, a global model. But instead of using triangle, triangles in a polygon mesh, we um, work with, with a voxel model. So a voxel model is a discrete grid, like a three-dimensional array, where we um, store information about this, the surface. 
but um, we don't use an occupancy grid. We um, model the surfaces as implicit surfaces, and that means uh, uh, we don't store um, explicit information of a soft um, surface in a voxel, but instead we only store distances to the closest voxel, uh, to the closest surface in each voxel. So the uh, model we use is called uh, the truncated sign distance function. And um, this was first demonstrated um, about uh, 15 years ago. Yeah, 15 years ago by uh, Curles and Lavoie. So they had a similar system, but it worked much slower and it had much uh, a lower re resolution. But um, the benefit of using this model is that we can um, accumulate data over time. If we had done it with um, a polygon mesh, it wouldn't be so trivial. And um, by using this implicit structure, we can actually average data from the previous frame with the current frame and kind of generate a, a memory and uh, some probability of where surfaces can lie. So in each voxel, we store sign distances, which means that um, voxels which lie in front of a surface and which have direct sight to the camera have positive distance values, and voxels which lie behind the surface have um, negative values. So it's kind of hard to imagine, but um, I'll um, show you a diagram. So it's a, a two-dimensional two version of the voxel grid. Here we have a depth measurement in the shape of a face. And um, along the ray from the voxel to the camera, we store the distance of the voxel to the surface along the arrow, as you can see. So this, this has a negative value because it lies behind the surface. And the next voxel has a smaller number because it um, lies closer to the surface. And we go on like this. So this, this voxel has a positive value. And at some point, so I will just quickly step through this. So we fill all the voxels with um, some numbers between uh, minus one and one. Uh, when we just look at the data structure, we don't see where um, the surface is. So uh, the trick is to look at the zero crossing. So we look at points where the value becomes from negative to positive, and that's where the surface is. And um, the real benefit of this data structure is that in the next frame, we kind of get similar uh, values in the voxels, and we can average these values with the current one and with the next one, and we will end up with lots of numbers, that, but there will be always only a single zero crossing. There will be only a single point where the voxel changes from positive to the negative. So um, that's uh, why we use the structure um, to represent surfaces. And um, to the last step of the pipeline. So now we want to render the things which are stored in the voxel model. And here we do the kind of opposite. So from the camera's, virtual camera's perspective, we travel along these arrays through the voxel. So here I travel from, from one to the next box, one, 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 and then um, step along the ray until I um, detect a crossing from a positive to the negative value. And if I find this crossing point, I render a pixel at that point. And um, this is the way we uh, extract um, a rendering from this volumetric model. And um, we don't only render uh, using this method, we also generate a synthetic depth map um, from this model to compare the current uh, frame to the previous frame in the tracking step. So we did an experiment um, where we um, tracked the camera based on 
the previous frame and the current frame, and we ended up with this kind of a, a mess. So um, the uh, tracking was smooth, but um, the uh, camera drifted over time, so it didn't make this circular shape, but it drifted away because it lacked an absolute reference point in the virtual model. But um, as soon as we um, used a synthetic death map from the model to uh, track the camera, we ended up with this nice model where we had an absolute reference point to the virtual scene. So I think it's maybe I couldn't describe it very well, but um, hopefully I'll be able to clarify it in the Q&A session. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think I've bored you a lot, so I uh, will uh, go to the more interesting parts, to the dynamic interaction uh, with Kinect Fusion. So, um, the concept, the, the, the three concepts for tracking and integrating data and raycasting, they're not new, and they're quite easy to understand, actually. And um, uh, we've already heard back from four to five people who have successfully implemented um, re-implemented Kinect Fusion based on the papers we published um, this year. So um, if you also want to publish, uh, to uh, re-implement the system, just uh, ask me and I'll uh, send you the papers. So, um, so let's have a look how um, Kinect Fusion can be used for more dynamic interaction scenarios. So here, um, this demo shows how um, an object can be segmented out from already scanned scene. So we scan in a scene, remove an object, and Kinect Fusion knows which object have been removed. And um, a little bit of theory. So um, we made a small modification to the integration step, which I showed you a couple of uh, frames before. Um, here, uh, we look at a specific voxel, the, the voxel with the green circle, and we uh, compare the model integrated into the volume with the current uh, depth value. So when, when this teapot stays at the same spot, the red depth value should coincide with the blue um, integrated model. But when I remove the teapot, then Kinect will actually only sense depth values from the table. So there's a big offset between uh, the voxel position and the actual depth position. And once we um, see a significant uh, difference between the uh, live depth measurement and the uh, voxel position, we uh, mark them as a separate object. And uh, I'll show you a quick video of how it works. Okay. So here we just scan in a small scenario, a table, including the teapot. And then at some point, At some point, we remove the teapot. And then, based on the um, algorithm I showed you, uh, instantly segments out the voxels, which don't have any uh, live depth values. And once we've segmented this object, we can then um, <laughs> track the object sufficiently. So looking from this small example, you can imagine to like, integrate text and other graphics into real world objects and how you can come up with um, uh, other uh, augmented reality applications. So um, the next demo will be actually a live demonstration. Here in this demonstration, I'll show you uh, a particle simulation where uh, virtual particles uh, bounce off uh, real-world geometries, and they even uh, 
get occluded by real objects because um, we um, simulate these particles and calculate the collisions based on um, uh, the model we integrated. And then we also uh, make use of the uh, uh, color camera to overlay the 3D model with um, uh, color information. So, um, just a second. Okay, sometimes I have to restart the, uh, the camera, sorry. Okay, so um, it's the same demo with um, some uh, color in information overlaid. I can also turn off the shading. Um, and then, uh, so I probably make a better, better scan of this environment. So once we um, scan in the environment, we can uh, let virtual balls bounce off the table. So they, they fall off the edge of the table, as you can see here, and uh, the virtual balls on the floor, they get occluded by the table and by this bag, and uh, I'll be a bit uh, nasty and I'll... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, if someone could come up, then uh, it might be better. So if, could you come up? Uh, could you sit on the table? Uh, not on the table, on the chair. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll just, yeah. So, wait a second. I haven't thrown any balls yet. Uh, okay. So I'm sorry for the action I'll do right now. <laughs> but, oh. <laughs> uh, so many windows. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> try, try to shake them off. Try to shake. Yeah, you can, you can move your arms and shake them off, brush, brush off your shoulders and then get rid of them. <laughs> okay, all the, so. Uh, really hard to see the mouse cursor here. So. <laughs> 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 so, okay. Okay, okay thank you. Okay, so it's, it's a really basic demo. Um, you can imagine having small cars and dinosaurs running around your living room. Uh, we were not really interested in doing this, so we just had some cheese balls. Um, so um, the next thing demonstrates the opposite of object segmentation. So instead of uh, segmenting an object which was previously scanned and removed, now we can compare the background with uh, objects which get integrated um, later on. So um, I'll start an another demo. So at first sight, the demo looks the same. It scans the background. But then, as soon as I integrate my arm, it uh, becomes another model. 
in this environment. And it also gets separately tracked. And uh, compared to a live um, Kinect image, it has a uh, much smoother surface because we um, do the same thing with the foreground model as we do with the background model. So we have two, um, two instances of Kinect Fusion running, and we um, separately track the background and the foreground, and then we uh, composite the graphics later on. Um, so uh, the most interesting part of this demo is that we can actually send some intersections of my finger with any object in the environment. So when I touch this cup, it knows that I'm touching the cup. Touch this, I don't know, this box, then it will uh, know that I'm touching the box. So wh what does it mean? It means you don't need to augment any surface. You just need a Kinect camera to turn any surface into a um, interactive um, tabletop screen. So uh, if you had a projector projecting onto the same space, you could actually draw on the surface without having it uh, modified. So um, in the next demo, I'll go a step further and then start to paint stuff on objects. So a really good side effect I discovered is um, I had this mounted in my office. And you could actually see what people have touched in my office. <laughs> <laughs> so when someone touches this cup, I know it. And it's kind of a fingerprint. <laughs> OK. So. Um, so these were the demos. Um, if you want to play with this, uh, you will have a chance in the Q&A session, hopefully. And um, yeah, I showed you this demo. And uh, I haven't really talked about the limitations, so I'll um, uh, sum the limitation up in this slide. So as we are working with um, a voxel model, it's not really flexible compared to a, a polygon mesh. So polygon meshes are used in games in, and in almost all 3D applications. But uh, we are bound to voxels. And it means that most of the surfaces we're working with only stay static. We can't animate them or move them. And uh, they don't connect. The data structure we have doesn't connect to DirectX or OpenGL. So we can't make use of fancy stuff like geometry shaders or vertex shaders. So this is uh, kind of a limitation. Um, yeah, so I said we can't uh, properly model deformations. It also doesn't work for large areas. So uh, we had this discrete grid, this um, three-dimensional array, and we have a fixed uh, resolution, and we can't go outside the box. So if I say um, I want to scan in this area, I can only scan in this area. And this part is allocated in the graphics card's memory. But if I want to go further, uh, it actually doesn't work. Um, so this is another um, limiting factor of using voxel data structures. And this downside um, is more uh, related to Kinect's ability. So Kinect's, Kinect works in the range of 50 centimeters to 8 meters. So when I want to scan someone in who is sitting at the back, it doesn't work. So unless we use another depth sensor, it's only, be able, it's only able to um, scan in things really close to uh, where I am. And another limiting factor of a Kinect is it doesn't work under sunlight. Kinect um, operates in the infrared uh, wavelength spectrum, and because the sun also emits infrared, we can't create enough contrast in the uh, sensor image to uh, acquire the depth of surfaces. And another thing is it actually uh, requires a really powerful gamer PC. So this laptop, it weighs seven kilograms. And 
<laughs> and the uh, power supply unit, it weighs three kilogram. <laughs> so, um, um, Andreas Steinhauser, he suggested to use this um, with robots or like drones, which can autonomously navigate within spaces. It would be awesome because a, a quadcopter, a quadrocopter could just fly around and it could scan in everything and it wouldn't um, hit any surfaces because it knows the environment. But because it relies on a really powerful PC, uh, we can't uh, use it in mobile scenario. So this is also another limiting factor. So, um, yeah, another thing is um, that Kinect actually struggles with um, surfaces which have little um, 3D features. So when I point the Kinect to a wall or to uh, the floor, the tracking algorithm doesn't know how it um, should align the current frame to the previous frame. So it, it rotates the image and the, the, the camera tracking really uh, doesn't work then. So that's why I uh, asked Andreas to set up this three-dimensional scene to um, create enough 3D features to make it work. So um, we've reached the end of the talk. In this talk, I presented Kinect Fusion, which generates um, uh, compelling uh, results just by using an um, off-the-shelf Kinect camera and uh, a powerful graphics card. And uh, I've also presented how uh, this system can be used in interactive um, applications like in augmented reality applications. And um, so, yeah, so I've come to the end of my talk and uh, now we can start with the Q&A. David Kim, Kinect Fusion. Thank you, David Kim. Um, as I announced at the beginning of the talk, we'll have a Q&A session now. I would ask everyone to remain seated, because otherwise there will be too much noise. Everyone who has questions, please line up at the microphones in the aisles. There are two microphones, in, one in each aisle. Um, also, the people in the front rows, I heard a few ask questions during the talk. I would also ask you to line up because uh, the people who are watching the streams cannot hear you. Um, questions are also possible uh, through the IRC it. channel, so the people watching people, the streams like. can also ask <laughs> questions. We have a signal angel so in the room. Tracking doesn't work. I'll start over here, please, the first. And restart it. Hold like on. This. Are okay. you ready for the first yeah, question? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> please, uh, the first question over here. Hello there. Um, Hi. I was first of all. I was one really quick question. Uh, uh, do multiple connects uh, interfere because you get multiple patterns thrown on on the scene? Yeah, they do because they produce so many dots in the scene, they can't actually figure it out. And uh, yeah, they huh? do. And I was wondering, have you have you thought about using multiple normal video images instead of the connect, uh, 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 using multiple video images and calculating depth information from that? Because uh, then you could do larger distances and you could do daylight and... Yeah, we are currently working on it right now, actually. So, um, using stereo cameras to feed the depth information into Connect Fusion. Yeah, thank you. Over there. Yeah, uh, I have two small questions. First, uh, in the beginning you were talking about uh, we're in um, two frames, you pick points and yeah. you check the angles and uh, yeah. everything. Uh, do you use all the points, or you have like a subset you, uh, you uh, let's choose? So we initially associate every single point. These are around 300,000 points. Uh, so we have end up with 600,000 points we work with, but uh, we don't use the points which have too much offset. But um, so I guess we use like 95% of all the pixels. Uh -huh. Okay, and the second question is, um, when you're showing the foreground versus background, how does the Kinect know which object is the foreground? By just uh, the uh, distance? Uh, yeah, so um, when we um, scan in the background, uh, we introduce a new foreground image. Then uh, when we um, calculate the distance from the camera's perspective, we hit uh, 
the live depth image first before we hit um, the background image. Uh, that's how we can segment it out. So when we hit depth image first, then we um, integrate this data in another Connect Fusion, and then we put them together. Thank you. Over here, please. You mentioned that there's been some re-implementations of your work. Do you know if any of the groups that have done that have released their code? Uh, yeah, so these were individuals, and um, I think people from Willow Garage have an implementation. It isn't as fast as ours, but uh, they uh, used the point, point Cloud library, I guess. Okay. Well, what, one other question. Um, what is the, the data rate of the, the data coming in from the Connect sensor? Because one way to use this for mobile devices might be to downlink that and do the, the computation uh, on the ground station. So um, the depth uh, frames, so each depth pixel um, um, consists of 16 bits. And we actually use 11 bits of depth pixel. But uh, so when we use 11 bits for uh, 640 by 480 resolution, then we end up with, how much was it, Andreas? 100 megabits per second. So um, you need a really fast wireless. But potentially that could yeah. be done. Yeah, or wireless USB or something. Yeah. OK, thanks. Thank you. There is a question on the IRC channel. Yes, the question is, um, does it work when you move the object rather than the camera? Does it create a 3D object then? Oh, yeah, it actually does. Um, I should demonstrate it. So it can be used to uh, need an object, a good object, which I use. So I point it to the sky. Oh, that. OK. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it works. So, um. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I, I don't want to hold. Do we have much, many more? Oh, we much? have more time. Yeah. We have time for that. So, we'll just take another question if that's okay. right. <laughs> yeah, uh, just one question. Have you considered using uh, sensors to get a better estimate on the initial position of the camera? Uh, no, so we haven't uh, looked into using acceleration sensor or uh, gyroscopes, but they could be combined. So, uh, for example, when Kinect loses tracking, we can then rely on uh, gyroscopes or acceleration sensors for the time. Over there, please. Hi there. Hi. Um, I wonder if you use uh, computer vision algorithms like ZIF features or so for remembering objects? Uh, we experimented with um, extracting features from the color image to uh, like recognize a scene. So we don't we can recognize scenes from a scan from somewhere else, but uh, it's not part of Kinect Fusion. So, but it, it would be possible because you have an association between the color image and the depth image. And another question is, uh, how do you determine the orientation of the six degrees of freedom from your camera? Um, the orientation of the camera? Yes. Um, so when we compare the depth images from the previous and the current frame, it doesn't only calculate the uh, translation, it also gives us the orientation information. So, um, so it's, uh, it's, it's uh, in the ICP or? Yeah, we use a modified version of the ICP, um, which, uh, where we assume that the angle is really small, so we assume the angle is almost zero. So we can um, just set zero and one for the cosine and sine and the transformation matrix. And by um, uh, simplifying these parameters, we can actually calculate the things much faster and it will lock uh, through the transitional offset. Uh, so <laughs> it's a bit hard to describe it, but um, I think the paper will have some more details about this. Thank you. There's another question on IRC. Yes, um, so the question is, you showed that you can see when uh, things are touched. So um, are you working on maybe making something draw on a board or something? Like, I mean? Um, that you track uh, if I draw on a board and then make maybe I draw on a, on a beamer and then make that show? Oh, yeah, actually, I forgot to show. Um, so where? 
I said the motivation of our work was to um, use it with an augmented projection. And um, in the end, Kinect Fusion became more interesting than the original handheld projector work. But uh, we have got a video of that working with, um, with the projection. So the major problem with um, the projector was that um, it had a big offset between the projection image and the tracking. So, um, yeah, so we can uh, create, uh, so this is the prototype it, we made. So it's a Kinect with a small Pico projector built into a single housing. So we first uh, built up a map of the environment with the Kinect. And then uh, we can uh, project graphics onto the surfaces. So the graphics stick on the specific surfaces because the camera is tracked. And um, this is the multi-touch uh, application. So you, you could use a portable projector to uh, paint to, to everywhere. But you can see this big offset. So when you s slightly tilt the projector, the, uh, the graphics is off. Another question over there. Thanks for the great demo. Um, you. If you'd remove all living material from this room, which means the plant and all the people, yeah. um, what's left will be mostly uh, basic geometric shapes like cylinders and cubes and a few spheres and cones. Yeah. Now, have you thought about um, fitting those basic geometry into your models, for example, figuring out that the table over there is actually just a huge flat cylinder sitting on top of a, a thin long cylinder to remove clutter and remove complexity and uh, allow for persistent storage and so on and so forth? Yeah, actually, we haven't, but it's a good idea. For example, uh, especially if you want to uh, uh, recognize scenes again, you can do it based on the basic primitive shapes you have seen already. As you said, like, I see this um, circle again and a box, and then I recognize where I'm. So, yeah, it will be a great idea. Another IRC question? Yes. Um, have efforts been made um, to use an FPGA rather than the really fast computer? Because uh, they can do parallel real fast. Well, it's... Uh, yeah, it's, I think it's more engineering than what we do usually, so we're, we haven't uh, tried it out, but uh, if someone can do it, then you should contact Microsoft and get hired. <laughs> Another question over there, please. Um, implementation question. Um, the data structure you're using for storing the volume information, is that a standard quad tree, and can you um, locally increase the resolution of that uh, octree, I mean octree, um, to uh, increase the resolution locally, and how do you handle these um, massive data that you accumulate over the, um, over one session, and are still able to render it? Because uh, I've seen you um, yeah. don't really drop much frame rate uh, over the course of one screen session. Uh, so we run um, the integration and rendering in two different threads. So we have a shared memory which contains all the volumetric data and the integration uh, thread, it always integrates into the memory and the render thread, it tries to render as much as possible. And um, back to your question about using orc trees, uh, we have tried it. Uh, we didn't succeed in having a GPU based Octa implementation because um, it's quite hard to manage uh, tree data structure on the GPU memory. So we ended up having a CPU data structure, but it uh, proved to be too slow for our application. But um, it's possible to increase um, the resolution to specific, in specific parts and to have lower resolution in other parts. And um, we would also have more efficiency in storing empty data because we wouldn't use too much memory. Yeah. <coughs> Are there uh, open source uh, implementation of uh, the algorithms uh, you presented? Sorry? Do, do, uh, are uh, there uh, open source implementation of uh, these algorithms uh, today? Uh, yeah, so we are 
making efforts to make it open source, but we have to go through lots of steps. And um, I don't know how, we, how long it will take, but uh, we are making an effort to uh, make it um, available. Thank you. Another question on this side. So we've basically seen this uh, on uh, yeah, a one by one um, meter scene here. How is it going for much smaller objects? Objects, let's say like a mobile phone, the candy bar class, scanning that one detailed and then directly printing it on a wrap wrap. Would that be possible? So only so the, you mean the Kinect only sees the mobile phone and nothing else? Or? Yeah, and it's a fairly small object and quite detailed. Would that work? Um, yeah, the Kinect. I think the Kinect's resolution is around a couple of millimeters, so um, it will pick up buttons in a phone, but I don't know. Uh, I think the tracking will have problems because the noise in the depth image is quite large, and it might be larger than the 3D features of the sm small mobile phone. Okay, thank you. Thank you. For those who want to leave, um Please do so now. We can continue the Q&A session. There's two more questions, apparently. Maybe more, more on IRC as well. The ones who need to leave because they need to go to another room, do so now. The rest, please stay. Because there's still quite some time left until there's another talk in this room, so... Uh. Okay, um, I'll, ex I'll accept two questions because I have to uh, catch a flight soon, so... Uh. Okay, I would ask you to ask your question, please. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm interested in the limitations or the, uh, the licenses uh, or patents that will be taken by uh, your sponsors. Are there any? Or second question, uh, is it planned to make this uh, platform independent? Uh, so um, I'm so I I don't so all the ideas and patents belong to Microsoft so uh, I can't do it independently as as a independent person if if that was the question. Are the patents taken already or, or licenses or what are the limitations that that are put onto you uh, because you're sponsored? Oh uh, well I'm. It's, I think it's uh, too specific. <laughs> um, so I, I, I didn't quite get your question, <laughs> sorry. So, could, so you you mean, rephrase, could you rephrase your question? I want to ask whether there are limitations uh, that anybody could use this in the future or ah. if there are already patents or licenses taken because you're sponsored, and that's not oh, yeah. uh, academic work uh, on your own, uh, and there, there are finances, as I understood. Yeah. Um, so you can re-implement it, because we have published papers describing how everything works. Um, I think, uh, and most of the algorithms are prior work, like ICP and the implicit surface data structure, they're already known techniques. We, I think we have, hold, we have applied for some patents, but uh, I don't know all the uh, specifics of how it's limited to use and how not. So, uh, and uh, the, the second question was about uh, platform independence. Uh, so it's written in CUDA and C Sharp. So um, if you... Have CUDA running on other operating systems? I'm I'm not sure if it if they are like Linux. So your publications weren't uh, specific on uh, on no platforms. no. So okay. It doesn't make 
Any assumptions about the operating systems? Thank you. Uh, okay. One last question, a very quick question, please. Hey, um, you said um, you can't use two connects parallel because the projected image would interfere with each other. But is it possible to use two connects and um, just use one projector? So the other connect uh, infrared camera sees what the projector from the other connect projects. So you had like two uh, passive sensors and one active? Uh, yeah, so you, you must write your own stereo algorithm for that. So um, in connect, the projector pro position and the camera position are calibrated to each other, so you can't remove them. But uh, yeah, if you have your own stereo algorithm, I think it might work. But is it possible to get the raw data from the infrared camera out of the connect? Yeah, it's possible. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, David Kim has to catch a flight. Please, another round of applause. Thank you.